welcome to Crime Most French, a weekly podcast taking you through intriguing cases carried out on French soil. Research and narrated by Cedric and rudely interrupted by me, Melanie. We're the true crime podcast on the lines. Crack open le vin and let the mayhem commence. Our six podcasts episode takes us to Brittany this week. It's another affair that's legendary in France. Everybody has heard of it, but not many people know how it ended. It's called L'Affaire Cesnec, the Cesnec Affair. I remember when I was a kid, I watched a documentary one summer night. That's when the documentaries were on about the affair. And I remember being outraged about the outcome of the story. Of course, I didn't know at the time. I don't I know it better now. The documentary was one-sided. We'll see that it's a lot less clear what, what really happened. Brittany's um, kind of very special place in uh, in France. It's very insular. I think if you asked uh, a lot of uh, Bretons if they could have independence, I almost think they would. They're almost like the Catalonians of uh, of France. Oh yeah, totally. There's three places in France that demand independence. It's Brittany, the Basque Country, and Corsica. Mm. And they're all listed in the EU as independentist regions. Mm. So, yes. Very strong identity. Yes. It's the few places where they actually still speak their original language. Mm-hmm. So if you go to Basque country, on the Spanish side, you get the Basque signs. You don't get them on the French side. No. But in Brittany, you get the signs all in Brittany as well. Mm. It's bilingual. Mm-hmm. I think it's the case in Corsica as well. That's that's only places. The story is Guillaume says neck. He is accused of having killed his business partner called Pierre Kemener, or Kemener, or Kemener, it depends how you want to spell it. Let's go for Kemener. He was the regional representative in Brittany. During one of their trip, only one of them came back. Oh, right, okay. So he was a government official? He, he was a regional representative yeah, of Finisterre, which is the tip of Brittany. Oh, okay. So uh, are we talking he was like a, an MP? MPs are per district, canton, whereas he was a regional representative. The regional elections are in two weeks' time here, so that's what he was. Okay. They have very little power, but they still exist. Okay. A hundred years later, there's still some activity on the case, as we'll see wow. in the story. So what's the story? Pierre Kemener is a businessman and politician, and he disappears during a trip from Brittany to Paris that he undertakes with Guillaume Cesnec in 1923. Okay. According to Cesnec, the purpose of the trip was to sell Cadillacs to someone in France with the purpose of eventually having them delivered to U- the USSR. So Cadillac as in car Cadillac? Cars and trucks and lorries. It's just after the First World War, and when the Americans left, they didn't take back all their stuff. They abandoned it wherever it was. Okay. So there was apparently a very large number of American cars and trucks that were left, okay. and the government, the French government, took them and was reselling them. Cheeky. Yes. Cesnec smelled something that could be profitable okay. by buying them super cheap from the French government and sending them to whoever wanted them no, more right, badly okay. than the French government. Okay. And one of the potential buyers was the USSR, mm-hmm. even though you weren't so allowed to sell stuff to the USSR at the time because it was after the revolution. Oh, yeah, of course. But the USSR being fairly poor and having come out of two wars, one internal civil war yeah. and one first world war, yeah. and they were very short on transportation, so they were buying stuff all over the place. Okay. and. That's what Cesnec's mount could be a good deal. Mm-hmm, yeah. So that was the purpose of their trip. Cesnec is said to be the last person who saw Kemener. So obviously he becomes the first suspect mm-hmm. when Kemener never comes back. Okay. He's quickly arrested, very quickly convicted, and he's sent to prison to Guyana. Like everybody, apparently, in uh, our podcast. Yeah, so basically, it was a Scooby-Doo. Um, it's way more complicated than Scooby-Doo. But in, we'll in, 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 to begin with, it sounds very, oh, it's all the only other person who's taking yes. part in the program. So this guy, obviously, just because he was there and he was the last person, ergo, it's this guy. Unmask him, send him to Guyana. Also, they were together on a trip to Paris. 
So yeah. everybody knew they were both going mm -hmm. to Paris together. Okay. And only one of them came, came back. back yeah. So he's the obvious. Uh, he is the obvious, yes. In this instance, he's the wife of the husband. Yes. But Kimono's body is never found. Even better, during the trial, several people say they have seen him at dates after when he was supposed to have been killed. Oh, right. Okay. So it's all very muddy. The press uh, relays the police theory mainly, which is that Seznek would have killed Kimono with his car's jack. Mm hmm brought back the body to Morlaix. Morlaix is where they both lived in Brittany, and then started the incinerator in his factory, and then burned the body and dumped the ashes after the murder. I wonder if an industrial incinerator would still get up to the thousands of degrees you would need to completely de decimate a body. I mean, you need incredible heat. Yes, but the thing that he just dumped the whatever's left somewhere... Oh, so he, he burnt most of it and then he burnt what he could, the yeah. rest. Yeah, that's okay. what they think. Okay. During the trial, there were 148 witnesses were heard, so a wow, lot well, of people. Wow, that's a lot of witnesses, yeah. It lasted weeks, and it ended in November 8, 1924. Mm -hmm. Sesnek is found guilty of two things. He's found guilty of producing false documents, and he's found guilty of murder. Okay. He is not convicted of premeditated murder. They don't think he had planned it in advance. It just happened. Must be very difficult to prove premeditation if you don't have a body, you don't have a method, you don't. That's, it would be impossible to prove. Yeah, that, that's very difficult. The one thing they know is that Kimono never came back. He was mm -hmm. never found, never heard of again. Mm -hmm. He just completely disappeared. So because he's the most likely suspect and because there are a few things that kind of show it could be him, He's the only mm, yes. person convicted. Nobody else is mm -hmm. ever investigated for the murder. Yeah, but he, he doesn't have a murder book on him saying, this is how I'm going to murder. No, there are things. We're, we'll, we're going to okay, see there are okay. a few okay. things. A whole judgment then. After um, the Second World War, the prison in Guyana is closed and he comes back. So he survived. Wow. He survived a long time over there, survived nearly 20 years. Wow, that's hardy. Yes, and he gets a 10-year... Uh, sentence reduction because the prison was closed. All wow. the prisoners got 10 years off. So he comes back on the 14th of May 1947. Okay. And he comes back to France, mainland. Uh -huh. And he dies on the 13th of February 1954 in a car crash. He's hit by a car. Oh, no. Oh, that's yeah. tragic to, to make it back from there and then make it yeah. almost 10 years and then. Yes. Oh, no. Bummer. Okay, let's look at the two main characters. Okay. First, Guillaume Seznek. Joseph Marie Guillaume Seznek is born on the 1st of May 1878 in Plumeau d'Erne, that's in Brittany. His parents, Yves and Marianne Collin, owned a fairly large farm in Carniol, okay. also in Brittany. His dad dies when he's six, and his mom takes over and runs the seven boys' household with an iron fist. So she actually takes over running the farm as well as the, the big family. Yes, she runs the household with all the boys and yeah. she runs the farm with the two employees as well. Wow, yeah, she must be str she must have made, been made of stern stuff. Oh yeah, she was. And they were all in all like that in Brittany. Mm. After a mediocre education, Cesnek leaves school and goes to work in the family farm as okay. he did at the time. Yeah. However, he's not that interested in farm work. He's more interested in mechanics. Okay. On the 18th of July, 1906, he marries Marie-Jeanne Marc. She's the daughter of merchants in Plomodien. Soon after, they both buy a business. They run a bicycle repair shop okay. opposite the church in the village. So he kind of does the mechanics he wants. It's on bicycle. It's not as great as he would want, but yeah, at but least basically. it's more interesting than farm work. Yeah, well, yeah. So he runs that for a while. Then he goes to the army to do his military service, uh -huh. which was three years at the time. And that's when his wife gives birth to a daughter named Marie on the 1st of November 1908. He's informed by a telegram of that happening, so he comes home very quickly. Mm -hmm. And when he arrives, he discovers his neighbor's barn is on fire. So he enters his shop, which was next to the barn, okay. tries to save whatever he could. But there is a petrol explosion. <gasps> And he gets pretty badly burned on the face and the hands. Oh, no. And he has uh, scars for the rest of his life. Dear. On the 13th of March, 1910, his son is born. He's also called Guillaume. And that's going to confuse things when we talk about people. 
So we're talking about Guillaume and Guillaume Jr. then? Yeah. Okay. With the insurance money from the fire, which was 30,000 francs, um, 1920 francs are about one euro today, so it's about 30,000 euros. Mm -hmm. He and his wife buy another business okay. in July 1912. They buy a laundry in saint pierre de culibignon mm -hmm. also in Brittany. It's in the suburbs of Brest. That's where part of the French fleet is based. There's really two main bases in France at that time. It's Brest and Toulon, so one Atlantic, one, north, one Mediterranean. One, yeah. That same year, another daughter is born, Jeanne. When World War I starts, war were declared. Okay. <laughs> uh, Cezanek isn't called because of his burns. They decide that he can't serve okay. uh, at that point. But the army takes over his shop and they task him of cleaning uniforms for the, ah, gar yeah. the garrison that's based in Brest. Okay. His four kids... A boy named Albert is born on the 31st of October 1914, so just after the start of the war, okay. which started in August. According to his grandson, which we'll hear of a lot, Cezanek volunteered to work at the gunpowder factory on the island of Huesson. He, according to him, would have stayed a year while Marie-Jeanne was looking after the laundry. Okay. But there is no proof of that. We don't know really for sure that he has volunteered. No paper has ever been found no. that he volunteered to the gun factory, the yeah. gunpowder factory. I would have thought he would have wanted to stay away from explosives and anything that could uh, start a fire. I would have thought. Yeah, he would think so. Also, mm. he has a shop that's fairly busy with mm. uniforms and yes. stuff. Why would you want to go and work yeah. in a gunpowder factory? Yeah, it seems very bizarre. So that's what his son says, Denis. Denis is the main character after the affair. In 1918, the Brest Regiment is moved to Morlaix and the uh, Cesnec family follows and that's why everybody ends up in Morlaix. Okay. They buy an amend abandoned sawmill at the time. It's not running, but they're planning to renovate it and run it again. And that's where essentially they stay for the rest of their life. Okay. The laundry remains in activity until it burns down in 1922. They seem to have an awful lot of businesses uh, burning down. Yeah. And it burned down just when one of Marie-Jeanne's brothers, Charles, was in the process of buying it. So they had already signed the papers and he was going to pay and all that. That's very unfortunate. Yep. And Cesnek was still the owner at that point because his brother I know hadn't mm. paid yet, received 23,000 francs from the insurance. Mm. The circumstances are suspect mm. and it's the second time as well. Yeah. There's two shops, two fires, two insurance payouts. Yeah. Even though there's nothing proved, we don't know there's any fraud or anything. No. It will come back at the trial and it's not going to play in his favour because okay. he's going to be presented as just a crook who okay. just burns down yeah. these houses or shops yes. and gets money. But it, it, we don't know. Is he unfortunate or? Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's at that time that Cezanek is planning to restart the sawmill, of course, because mm -hmm. the shop is now oh, gone. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's also when he meets Pierre Kemener, because Kemener was at, the, at that point mainly a wood dealer. So he would buy cheap wood from the local mm -hmm. farmers and peasants and sell, sell it to somebody who pays more money for it. Mm, okay. Kemener becomes very interested in one of Cezanek's deals, which was that after the war, he bought a large amount of blankets from the army. And he was planning to sell those blankets to whoever wanted them. Okay. And Cezanek thought that's way, a way to make money. And Kemener realized that it probably was, so he wanted in on it. So he kind of befriended Cezanek uh -huh. and get his hand on that pile of blankets. Yeah. That seems very strange. It, it is. It is. But Is there really a great fortune to be made by blankets? I, I don't see, I don't know the amount, I couldn't find it, but I don't know, early 20th century, maybe thousands and thousands of blankets that could be money to be made, especially if you got them really cheap, because they weren't used by the army anymore, because the army, of course, was a lot smaller after the war, so... Well, I guess things were probably more utilitarian at that. It, certainly now, I couldn't imagine uh, anyone, any shishi... Uh, Bobos from uh, Paris beating down uh, his door to buy uh, a fancy blanket, fancy army blanket for their shishi uh, flats and a, and a flash of rondes, mom. But I imagine those blankets were really scratchy and oh, yeah. Yeah. itchy and horrible. Mm. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was a market, I don't know. Mm. In 1923, after a lot of renovation, the sawmill starts again. Okay. So he invested the money and did start the sawmill right. as he was planning to do. The company employs a dozen workers, and there are two of them, especially who are, who are 
very faithful to the Sesnik family. Okay. It's Angèle Labigny, who is the house employee, and she becomes one of the creditors for Sesnik, so she lends him quite a bit of money for mm-hmm. renovating the sawmill. Okay. We'll learn about it during the trial because she's listed as one of the creditors. Mm-hmm. And also Samson, Samson mm-hmm. in English, who is the driver. But in fact, he looks after the machinery and the cars. Mm-hmm. Now, let's move on to Pierre Kemener. He was born on the 19th of August, 1877 in Kemener, also in Brittany. Everything takes place in Brittany, nearly. His parents owned a small farm. In 1903, the farm is sold, and he and his brother and his sisters buy a small house in Saint-Sauveur. And the, small, the ground floor is a small bar. Like a pub. Okay. He has a lot of ambition, but is quite poor. And his family is all the way down at the bottom of the social ladder. Mm -hmm. But he's ready to do anything to get out of poverty and go up the social ladder. And he's elected municipal councillor in 1914. At that point, to make money, he trades pretty much anything. So he trades wine, cider, charcoal, cattle, anything. Mm -hmm. But he's not very successful as a a trader. He's a bit of a Dow boy, is he? he? He is. At the time, that's pretty much what he is. He starts a wood training business where he buys from farmers and sells it on to other people. And at the start of World War I, that's a very good idea because in the trenches, you need to reinforce the sides. Yeah. And how do you do it? With wood. Mm-hmm. So you need a lot of beams, a lot of mm, yeah. wood to, mm-hmm. co- to cover the, the sides. Load wood, yeah. yeah. And he's the one selling it to the army. Okay. So at that point, that's the right business to be yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. And he was lucky to be there. So at the end of the war, he's very rich. Mm-hmm. So he went from poor, yeah. at the mm-hmm. bottom of the social yeah. ladder, to public representative on a small scale uh-huh. and very rich. So he just happened to be right place, right time, rather yeah. than being a, a successful entrepreneur. Yeah. But after the war, he expands internationally and he sells to England, Germany, Belgium, among okay. others. And his fortune is estimated to 2 million gold francs. Oh, okay, so I mean... So we're talking millions of euros. He, d- he managed to turn it around. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was very, very lucky. Mm-hmm. At the time, he was in the right business when mm-hmm. the army needed him. Yeah. And he just made a lot but of money. he managed to build on his luck, so he wasn't entirely yeah. useless. Yeah. It's always a lot easier to be successful when you start with a lot of money. Well, yes, exactly. <laughs> That's the thing. So. Mm-hmm. so at that point, he buys a very large house in Landerneau, which is called Caire Abri. I remember in Breton, Caire means hill. Okay. So Cabri, I'm guessing, means house on the on the hill. Okay. But don't quote me on that. I don't really speak Breton. <laughs> it looks like a castle. You have la- the the towers, the round towers. Oh, the everything. turrets. It, yeah. It's a mini castle. Mm-hmm. He then buys another property with a very large domain, which is mostly woodland. Okay. And that's for his business. Mm, yeah. That so would make he sense. runs the wood- mm-hmm. woodland, but he's busy, so he gets his brother Louis to manage okay. all the wood management in the mm-hmm. in the, for the property. He lives in Carabri with his sister Jenny. She looks after the house. Okay. So he essentially employs his, his whole family. Mm. And his other sister got married in 1920. That's why she doesn't stay with him or work for him. Okay. But she, she gets married to a notaire clerk. Okay. And he lends him 160,000 francs to buy the notaire charge. Because to be a notaire, it's like being a taxi. You have to buy oh, yes, a uh-huh. license. Mm-hmm. And the number of licenses is finite. There's a specific number of licenses. He lends him the money. He complains, though, quite a number of times that the brother-in-law is not repaying fast enough. Okay. So once he's fairly successful business-wise, he decides to become more successful politically. Okay. So he runs for more elections and is eventually elected at the regional level in 1919. At that point, he considers that he's arrived. He is a member of exclusive clubs, for example, where only politicians and CEOs meet. And he meets a lot of rich people. So he now is who he wanted to be at the start of his life. So monetary, financially successful, now socially successful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In 1922, Kemena meets Sesnek. As Sesnek is restarting the sawmill, he's working on renovating Mm -hmm. it. They become associates very quickly. Mm-hmm. And according to Sesnek's grandson, again, although he was born 20 years after the fact, Kemener and Sesnek understand each other because they both are successful and were both self-made. Mm. 
So they started both fairly poor. Yeah. They now both run businesses and they did it entirely yeah. themselves. Mm-hmm. Again, as the grandson's word, we don't yeah. know. There's no lot of information about that. That's what he says. And that's when Kamenar learns about that big pile of blankets. Ah, yes. Because the blankets. Sesnek tells him, oh, I have that big pile of blankets and mm. I'm planning to sell them. So they become friends. Sesnek is said to have offered to buy one of Kimono's properties. Okay. There's a sale contract, which is typed on a typewriter called the Royal Ten. That's very important for the rest of the story. Okay. Because it's very rare at the time. That typewriter is eventually found in a suitcase. That suitcase was owned by Kimono. So you see where that's going? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The sale contract indicates that the sales price for the property is 35,000 francs. Mm-hmm which is nowhere near the value of the house, which was at the time estimated at 100,000. So something is very fishy here. Yeah, it sounds here. fishy, yeah. During the inquiry, the judge decides that that has to be a fake document. Yeah. He apparently wrote a contract that gives him a house at a fraction of the price with a typewriter, which was very rare, which is found in the victim's suitcase. Okay. One of Sesnik's qualities, according to Kemener, is that he's very discreet. So... What he knows, he doesn't tell anyone. Okay. That's one of the things Kemino likes about him. And that's why he wants him around, mm-hmm. because he can involve him in things. Yes, he knows where the bodies are buried, but he won't say anything. Exactly. Mm-hmm. We don't know where these are, but several witnesses during the trial mentioned that they are aware that Kemino is involved in dodgy dealings. Yeah. Nobody knows what they are. There's no proof of any mm-hmm. of that. But that's the story, that says Nick probably knew them. Yeah. And was expected to not tell anyone about it, yeah. and never did, because nobody ever nobody heard about it. Nobody knew, them. but we're under smoke. Yeah. One day, Sesnek offers a new deal to Kemener, the Cadillacs. Mm-hmm. He bought them from the French government, and he has a buyer. Mm-hmm. So he, he has essentially sealed the deal. So what they need to do now is go to Paris with one of the cars to okay. show the car to yes. a buyer, mm-hmm. so the buyer knows they exist and what they are, so that they can sign the sale contract okay. and get the money. Mm-hmm. And that's the trip that they take to Paris together. Okay. And that's when, on the 25th to the 26th of May, 1923, Kimono disappears. Okay, and only trace. one of them comes back. Only one of them comes back. Mm-hmm. Let, let, let's look at the chronology. Okay. So on the 24th of May, 1923, at half ten in the morning, Sesnek leaves his house with the Cadillac. Okay. He was the one looking after. In mm-hmm. fact, we learn later that it's Samson that does. Okay. Oh, yes, the driver. The driver. Mm-hmm. On the same day, Kemener takes the 844 train. Mm-hmm. The two men were planning to meet in Rennes, which is Eastern Brittany, yeah, yeah. at 2.30 p.m. in a hotel. Okay. From there, they plan to drive all the way to Paris together. Okay. That would take a while. Seznek is delayed because he says the car breaks down several times. Well, it's not good when you're uh, trying to sell. (laughs) It's not a good quality (laughs) car, no. He gets to Rennes, but he gets there at 7.30 p.m. Oh, so he's five five hours hours late. late. Uh As he's waiting, Kemener telegraphs his brother-in-law asking him again for money. So we know Kemener is in Rennes at that point. There's proof of it. So in return, the brother-in-law sends him a check for 60,000. So That's a lot of money. Yes, but it's still barely more than half the money. Yeah. In fact, no, it's less than half the money because it's 160,000 euros him. On Friday the 25th, 1923, says Nick and Kemena take the road with the Cadillac, mm-hmm. but it breaks down and tires blow out the whole way. I guess cars at that time weren't reliable anyway. To avoid being late at their appointment in Paris, Kemena appears to have suggested to take the train to Paris and says Nick would eventually get to Paris with the car, but at uh-huh. least he would be in Paris to talk to the buyer. Yeah. Kemener, who told his family he'd be back by the 28th of May. Okay, so what date was that? 20th, 25th okay, of Okay, so that's three days' time. Yeah. Okay. So we had planned, yes. Mm-hmm. It would take about a day and a half to go to Paris and a day and a half to come back. Okay. On the 28th, he disappears. There's no trace of him. Nobody ever hears again from him. But he went to the meeting. We don't know who the buyer is. That's one of the weird things about That's the story. very strange. We know a name which doesn't exist. That name has never been found anywhere by the police. It's not a name that exists. But um, if, if they were both meeting 
the same person. Why didn't Guillaume say, well, we're meeting this person such and such and we met them here and... We have a name. Okay. But it's not a name that exists. It's not a person that is ever found. Um, I can't find it right now. It's in my notes. It's Chate or Sh- Chate or something like that. It's not a uh-huh. name that really is a person that is ever found. So we don't know if there was an actual buyer. We don't know uh, if, if there was a buyer, if that person was who he said he was. We don't know anything oh, about it just, that. It just does not sound good, does it? No wonder. No. So we have no way to know if Kimono ever reached Paris. No. At that point, that's it. He just, it's, it's just gone. vanished, yeah. yeah. There's never anybody who reliably can show they saw him or mm-hmm. heard from him yeah. after that date. But we'll see. There's a few more things happening. Seznek, who is tired of breaking down, decides to go home. And on 27th, he gets home with that Kimono. So he never even made he, it to Paris? He never ever tried to get to Paris. At some point, he decided, that's it, I have enough, I'm going okay. home. And he went home. What is slightly strange is that the car made it home when yeah. he didn't think it would make it to Paris. That's very strange. From the 4th of June, several members of the Kimono family become worried. They contact Seznek neck and ask him for news and he tells them that he dropped off Kemener at the train station for a train to Paris mm-hmm. and he says he hasn't received any news since. He says that Kemener must be making a lot of money and is so busy that he doesn't have time to contact him or his family. Mm. He even mentions that it's possible that he went straight to America to make more deals. That's his explanation. Yeah, that sounds very weak. On the 10th of June, Kimono's brother-in-law, brother, and Seznek report him missing to the police. Okay. So it took not far off two weeks. Mm-hmm. On the 13th of June, a telegram signed Kimono is sent from Le Havre, so a port not yeah, far yeah. Mm-hmm. in Normandy, not Brittany. Mm-hmm. That is the main port for U.S. ships. Okay. So if he wanted to go to the U.S., he would have taken the boat in Le Havre. Mm-hmm. The telegram says... I will come back to Landerno in a few days. Everything is good, signed Kimena. So the family, reassured by the telegram, Mm -hmm. asks the police to stop looking for him because they know. But on the 16th of June, they change their mind. They contact the police again and say, we don't think he's gone. Something's wrong. He's still missing. Find him. Because that's quite a big gap. Also, they they don't believe the telegram eventually. They probably did that first because they wanted to, but then looking at it, it it Mm -hmm. doesn't sound right. So they don't believe it's him who sent the telegram. So what was the 28th of May, he said he would be home, and that was, what, the 17th of the next month? So, I mean, that's... The 16th, yeah. I mean, that's like almost the guts of three weeks. Yeah, yeah, that's a long time for being missing. On the 20th of June... An employee of the train station in Le Havre discovers a suitcase in one of the lockers. Uh Aha, okay. The lock is broken, Mm -hmm. and it seems to have been in seawater. I couldn't find why they knew it was seawater, but that's what it said. And it has blood stains. It contains clothes, a leather document bag, Uh and Kimena's wallet. Okay. And his family is notified that that's been found. Right. So he's clearly not going to America without his wallet. On the 22nd of June, a missing person inquiry is opened in Brest. Mm-hmm. The suitcase is taken as evidence. On top of the clothes and the wallet, the suitcase contains the sales contract we talked about, yeah. where Sesnick buys the house for a really cheap price. It also contains a notebook listing some expenses, mm-hmm. and some of these expenses are train tickets. The train tickets are from Dreux to Paris, and then Paris to Le Havre. So Dreux is west of Paris. Okay. Not very far from Paris. It's probably 100 kilometers, if mm-hmm. that. So it would kind of like suggest he did go to Paris. It would tend to show that Kemenov bought these tickets mm-hmm. because he wrote them down in his notebook. But it would prove what Seznek said, yeah. even though Seznek couldn't tell which train station he dropped him off at, which also that everybody found very strange. Yeah, it's very fishy. If you, yeah, if you leave somebody at a train station, you should really remember which one. <laughs> yeah. But apparently he can't remember which one, so that would tend to show it was Dreux. Mm-hmm. The police doubts, really, that notebook, because it's, it looks fishy. It's too convenient. Also, the prices are wrong. Oh. So I found two explanations for these prices. One was that they're completely wrong, mm. made up, which would show that it's not him writing down yeah. what he bought. Mm-hmm. I saw also a source that said they were without tax, okay. and that makes them wrong, but not mm. so wrong. If it was really noted without tax, maybe he didn't pay the taxes. 
So maybe, in fact, they were right. It is difficult mm, to know. Yeah. Uh, we yeah, need could to just find out exactly what it yeah. was, but it's way too late now. No, no. Who was going to find the prices from 1923 between mm. <laughs> two stations? Yeah. But anyway, the police goes with the fact that they are wrong, mm -hmm. and therefore they decide that's not him. No. You know, it's a, it's, it's a just fake, too convenient. Fake thing. It's just, yeah. It's mm -hmm. just evidence that's been planted there. On the 26th of June, Seznek is interviewed by the police for the first time. Mm hmm he insists again that he dropped him off at the train station. This time he says Dreux, um, mainly because he was probably told that's where the suitcase uh, notebook was mm -hmm. saying the tickets were from. He said that it was because the car was too unreliable and he didn't think it would make it to Paris, so he dropped him off at the station and, and just went home. He also affirms that the sales contract wasn't for the house. It was for part of the house because he had already paid 4,040 golden dollars for the house. Okay. Which, if you take the the value of the gold dollar at the time and the 35,000 francs, would make a total payment of 95,000 francs, which is very close to the value of the house, given that they were friends, maybe yeah, he, he gave them 5,000 off or something, yeah, yeah, small yeah. discount. So at that point, if it is true, it is not impossible that this is mm -hmm. what he says. Yeah. It's just the rest of the money that he needed to pay to get the house, but he yeah. has already paid money. Unfortunately, there's no witness for the transaction in, in dollars. So we don't know if it's true. We don't know where they would come from. And that's one of the things that was mentioned at the trial. Mm. How did he get his hand on so many American gold dollars? Yeah. Some say he was already sold some of the Cadillacs he had. Okay. But again, no trace of it. So it's hard to know where he would, uh, would have got that money. So we don't know. Sesnek explains that Kemener needed liquidities to sell the, the Cadillacs for the deal. So he doesn't know more than that himself. Mm -hmm. So he say, he explains that he paid in gold dollars because he's going to buy and sell cars to and from Americans, possibly. Yeah. So he needed that kind of money. He had it. He gave mm -hmm. it to him in exchange for the house. That's how he kind of explains where the money yeah. came from and went to. There are more evidence, if we can call it evidence, of Sesnik's story. For example, a letter is found in uh, the suitcase, which apparently comes from the American Chamber of Commerce in Paris. That's what the letter had said and mm -hmm. everything. And it would kind of imply that there was a deal with the Americans to get some of the cars as well. Again, it is considered evidence for a while, but after it's looked at a bit more closely, it becomes a lot less sure. Okay. Seems to be quite common with this case that a lot of the evidence on the surface looks fine and then it all of a sudden doesn't. Yeah. The end of says next story is that he went home after he dropped off Kemener and Dreux mm -hmm. because he decided to go home. The car was too unreliable yeah. and he gave it to his driver, Samson, to fix. Mm -hmm. Of course, remember, Samson is one of the two very, very faithful employees. Mm, yes. so can you believe what he says? Yeah. He's probably not the best witness in the story no. because he would possibly say anything he's told to say. Yes. Yeah, so so hmm. Sesnek is interviewed again on the 28th of June 1923 in Paris this mm -hmm. time by the chief Achille Vidal. He tells a fairly consistent story. So at no point they have the feeling that his story is made up because he keeps the same story, gives the same details. It, if you talk to him, it kind of looks like it's true. He's okay, just yeah. telling the story as it was. Yeah, so that's very evident when somebody in a murder case is lying, is the story always continually yeah. changes. But if you're, if you've got the one story consistent, then yeah. Yeah, it's you consistent can, you... even to the details of what the breakdowns were and what happened mm. where on the way. So it, it is consistent. It mm -hmm. looks like a real true story. Yeah. So now let's have a look at the findings of the inquiry. As early as the 29th of June, the investigators doubt Sesnek's story. Mm -hmm. First of all, there are several witnesses who saw Sesnek and Kemener together in Oudan. Mm -hmm. Oudan is only 60 kilometers from Paris. So it would make no sense for Kemener to have taken the train further away from Paris in Dreux. Also, some wit witnesses say they saw them live in the car okay. together. Right. After people remember because they asked for the road to Paris. Mm -hmm. So there are several things. One is it's closer to Paris than Dreux. Mm -hmm. The witnesses saw them live together in the car. Mm. And at the time witnesses saw they interacted with them, the last train to Paris was gone already. Uh. So it, at that point, it looks impossible for Kemener to have taken the train to Paris because where from? Mm. 
Other witnesses say they met Seznek in La les yvelines which is only 15 kilometers from Moudon, in his car on the road to Paris. Okay. And one of them says that they sold him petrol because he had run dry. <laughs> and Seznek says, yeah, it happened. Yeah. And that's when his story starts not working anymore because if he had dropped Kimono to Dreux, mm -hmm. how was he found seen in Oudan? And why was he seen even closer to Paris on his own, in his car, on the road to Paris. Oh, his story, Did he go to Paris yeah, on his own? His story just sounds so fishy. At that point, the story becomes more and more fishy because more and more witnesses poke holes in yeah. it. Yeah, but we know what witnesses, witness statements are sometimes utterly worthless. Yeah, that's the thing, yeah. So you can't really trust them all. No. Are they really sure it was him? Are they sure it's even that day? You are know? they sure it was even that time? Exactly. Could it be half an hour earlier? Mm. It's difficult to know. So on the 30th of June, Sesnik's house is searched. On the 4th of July, five witnesses place Sesnik in Le Havre, okay. where he says he's never been in his life. Uh, okay. It is the day the telegram was sent uh, from Le Havre. Definitely from, sounded from fishy. His family. Yeah. I bet Le Havre does smell fishy, but it's starting to smell even more fishy now. Yep. Also, one witness says that Sesnik, under the name Ferbourg, bought a typewriter, second-hand, a Royal 10, uh -huh. in his shop, uh -huh. next door to the post office, where the telegram was sent from. Okay, and would that have been to type up a contract, do we think? It could have been. Mm -hmm. So Cessnick denies he's ever been to Le Havre in his life, Okay. but difficult to know if it's true or not. Mm. Also, he points out that uh, witnesses said Ferbour had a hairy hand, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's something the witness noticed, but Seznek doesn't have hairy hands because they were burnt oh, yeah, petrol in the first true, explosion. Yeah. So he has no hair whatsoever on his, on his hands. So is it really the person the witness yeah. saw? Is it somebody else that kind of maybe hand. looks like him? Was it a Muppet? <laughs> who has? It, who would describe somebody's hand as well, hairy? I guess if you have very dark hair... You have hair on your hand, it becomes obvious that you have hair on your hand. I mean, I would describe Maybe. you as her suit, but not as having overly hairy hands. Maybe. Well. I don't know. But clearly, says Nick, doesn't have hairy hands. That's something that's sure, that can't be debated. How, um, w when he had all these burns, did he have any burns on his face? Yes. So, I mean, he did... One side of his face is burned, yeah. He, he did, he obviously would have had quite a distinctive look then yeah there's photos of him on the website yes. ah, yes, uh -huh, yeah so yeah, he has an eye that's kind of closed and mm. one side of his face is scarred so it gives a bit of credibility to witness statements then because he is so d distinctive looking with his non-hairy hands yeah but at the same time why recognize the hands and not him directly well, yeah that is so, true i don't know i i can't i can't tell i have issues with the hairy hands yeah says next wife confirms that her husband left the house on the 12th of June, with mm -hmm. the car. But witnesses say they saw him on the 13th of June in Montparnasse at the train station. In Montparnasse Paris. in Paris, yeah. Uh -huh. What was he doing in Paris? He Montparna to be in Paris? Yeah, Montparnasse is not anywhere yeah. near Lave. And they see him carry heavy package. What could it be in that package? Mm. And they also say saw him take a train to Brittany. Mm. And also more witnesses see him on the 14th of June in Brittany, where he picks up his car again. Okay. So he's out and about, but in various different places, yeah, doing various different that things. Yeah, he never explained that trip to Paris. What, what would Why? he do in Paris? Yeah. So you could imagine maybe it's when he met the buyer the first time, because True. he had a buyer name, so mm. maybe he met him in Paris, but he never mentioned it. No. So and and, and he, he was doing dodgy dealings, or possibly dodgy yes. dealings. So. For Kimono, possibly, as well. Yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Who knows? On the 6th of July, his house is searched for the third time. Wow. But this time, they concentrate on the sawmill and they find the typewriter. It matches the description of the typewriter bought in Le Havre mm -hmm. and it's sent to Paris for expertise to okay. check mm -hmm. if things have been written with it. One of the policemen in charge of the investigation on a very low level, so I think he signed only five out of 500 documents okay. for the investigation. It's called Pierre Bonny. It is fairly important because he's fired from the police in 1935 for corruption. Oh dear. So about 10 years later. He then plays a role in the Gestapo during the war. Oh right, And okay. he's recognized by a woman who was sent to a camp by him 
during the war, and he's shot in '44 for collaboration collaboration with the Germans. And he sounds like a nice chap. It doesn't say anything about Seznik and the affair, but it is used later on by his descendants to try to discredit the investigation mm. because that guy was somehow vaguely involved. At the time, he was only a secretary for a, a chief of police, so he wasn't really investigated, no. investigating on no. on site or anything, but no. he signed five documents. He, saw, he signed five documents and then a decade later. Yeah, yeah no, it's a bit... He's a scumbag, but... So no, not, nothing. It's not credible. It's no. probably nothing. The forensic tests eventually come back for okay. the typewriter, and they prove that it was used to write the sales contract. Ah. The forensic tests also show that the handwritten notes in Kemmerer's notebook were written by Sesnek. Oh, okay. So they decide, yeah, Sesnek yeah, mm-hmm. did all that. However, when Sesnek is told that they found the typewriter in his sawmill, he appears very surprised. Okay. So you can wonder why is he surprised? Mm, yeah. <laughs> if he left it there, eventually yeah. he would have known it would be found. So mm, don't know. The final two witnesses say they saw Seznek in the Havre in the train station with the suitcase that was eventually found in the locker. Okay. Or the name of the buyer for the casa. I might not say it's called Chardy or Chardy. Chardy. It doesn't exist. It's Chardy. Not, yeah. Smooth operator. The, the, as far as the police is concerned, it's entirely made up by Seznik. Yeah. And it's not a real person. In 1926, so after he was convicted, Seznek mm-hmm. says that he thinks that Charlie was, in fact, Ujima Sherdion, or Gerdion. That person does exist. Okay. He bases his information on something he heard when he was in prison, mm-hmm. because Gerdi is identified as a traitor by another p- woman um who was a resistant and was sent okay. to a camp. And he she identifies that he had deals with Bonnie as well. So Bonnie comes back. Okay. So Sesnik says it's him that was going to buy the cars. Again no the police doesn't believe it for a no. second and they just yeah, ignore it whatever. completely. Mm-hmm. Also during the inquiry, the letter that was supposed to be sent by the American Chamber of Commerce in Paris mm-hmm. is shown to be a fake. Okay. Mainly because the envelopes are not the same envelopes used by the American Chamber of Commerce at the time. Okay. So it looks real when you look at it, but the envelope is wrong. So they decide, nah, it, it's Close, not them. Not quite. It's, it's a fake. Yeah. So they completely ignore that. There's not a clue for yeah. it. So the trial runs from the 24th of October to the 4th of November 1924. Mm-hmm. As I said earlier, 148 witnesses are heard. The jury find Zeznik guilty of murder and also guilty of creating uh, fake documents. Mm-hmm. And they exclude, as I said earlier, premeditation and entrapment. On the 4th of November 1924, the court sentences Zeznik to life of hard labor in, in Guyana. Guyana. Mm-hmm. He appeals, but his appeal is rejected on the 8th of January 1925. Mm. So that's it. That's the end of the story. He's found guilty. Yeah. He's sent to prison. And for, for me, it feels a bit weak. It feels, why would he have done, I mean, j- just for one small property, why Why would he kill, you know, surely that would have been the killing the, the golden goose at that point. Surely there was bigger eggs to fry. The guy had quite a lot of property and stuff. Why? Why would he have done it for such a small amount of 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 money and it just it just seems weird it just seems he's he's the only one that probably seems like he has a motive but it seems like a weak motive yeah there's a lot of unanswered questions one of them is why would he have done yeah. that because they were dealing together and they had been for yeah a number of years mm-hmm. why as far as everybody said they were getting along fine yeah. they trusted each other they were friends mm-hmm. why would he have killed him there's just no explanation why do it on that trip to paris yeah for half especially a if it wasn't premeditated yeah for half why? a house it just seems yeah, for, it, it doesn't make sense it's weird also why would he, why did he keep the typewriter yeah he could have got to Got rid of it anywhere. Mm. Just drive near a swamp, oh, yeah. throw it in the swamp. Exactly. Gone. It would never be found. Mm. Why hide it in your factory? Mm. It doesn't make sense. Also, he looked surprised. You could interpret it in two ways. One is he gave it to someone to get rid of, and that person was stupid enough to put it there, yeah. and he was surprised it was there. Mm-hmm. 
Or he actually didn't know about it. Yeah. He had been told about the typewriter, but as far as he's concerned, it's not his. Mm-hmm. Why would he worry about it? And suddenly it is in his sawmill. Yeah. So yeah, of course, you would be surprised mm-hmm. <laughs> because it's not supposed to be there. It's not yours. Also, did the money, the dollars, the gold dollars really exist? We have no trace of that no, transaction. No. So how did he get that money? Did he deal with the Americans? But yeah. why did he not mention it? He has no proof of anything. And also, why that amount? It's a weird amount, 4,040. Yeah. 40, 40, why choose that number? Mm. It, it is very strange. Also, why keep the car? If it's supposed to go and sell it to the buyer, yeah. don't come back with it. Yeah. It doesn't when, make any sense. When you're Dump that, it. W- when you're that close. Yeah. Lose it. At the yeah. time, cars had no serial number. Just take the plates mm. off, dump yeah. it somewhere. Nobody mm. will know whose cars it is. Exactly. So why keep it? Why go home with mm. it? It doesn't make any sense. No, none of it makes any sense. Also, how was it not reliable to go to Paris, but enough to do more, more kilometers to go back home? To go home? back home, yeah. It's very rum. Yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense. No. no. During the trial, they had the car tested to try to prove what he was saying in terms of breaking down. Okay. And the, the, the mechanic that tested it, th- there were several problems that uh, Sesnik mentioned. One of them was that it, the dynamo um, wasn't working. Okay. So it wasn't generating electricity for the lights. Mm-hmm. But the guy who tested it said, no, the dynamo is nearly new. It's not done more than 2,000 kilometers. It works perfectly okay. well. So why did Sesnik say it wasn't working? Also, he did stop in a garage not far from Paris to get a new light. And mm. the guy who he said he had talked to, the police found. Yeah. And he said, yeah, yeah, he bought, he came to me and I didn't have any light bulbs for cars. So I said, I sold him a normal light bulb and I told him, don't use it too much because it's going to blow up. Mm. So he, some of what he said did mm. happen. And then some of it didn't. But some doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Also, the jack of the car did disappear. And that's why the police thinks that that was that's a murder the way weapon. he killed the guy. Mm-hmm. But again, there's a guy who, in Dreux who said he, swore, he swears he saw it in the car on the way to Paris in Dreux. Mm. It's an odd thing to remember. But another one in La Cueille des Yvelines, so closer to Paris, says that, it definitely wasn't there when he looked at the car, when it broke down again. So did it disappear between Dreux and La Cue des Yvelines? Mm. Also, if you're going to kill someone with your jack, replace it. Yeah. Make sure it's there so that if the police looks, they find one. Yeah. Also, you think he would, if you're going to murder somebody, you tend to murder where you're comfortable, where you know the environment. Yeah. And, and clearly they were, they were far away from home at that point. Yes. So you wouldn't necessarily yeah. know where to hide a body. Also, his his explanation doesn't make sense when you go back to the jack. Yeah. It was 15 kilos. Who loses a 15 kilo yeah, jack? Yeah, quite a lot. On the road? Yeah. yeah. Also, why send a telegram from Le Havre? What yeah. would that do? Why yeah. would he send that telegram that pretends that the dude is going to yeah. to the US? Is, is there a shadowy figure we're just not knowing about? Is there some kind of scurrilous dealings that we just don't know about that uh, would suddenly make the whole thing very clear. Yeah, and also, didn't he think that the police would look into it? Mm. Why would he do that? Yeah. It seems stupid. So he does a lot of things that either are so stupid mm. that it's hard to believe he would have done it, Yeah. or he didn't do them and is in fact innocent. Yeah. Because if the main thing that sent him to jail is that typewriter. Because mm. that's the one clue that the police has that they can kind of show was used to yeah. buy a dodgy uh, house in a dodgy way. But everything else is very circumstantial. Yes, yeah, so like very much The missing so. jack. Mm. Well, is the guy who saw it in the road really sure it was there? Yeah, because yeah. he didn't look for it. So how does he really know it was mm. there? Maybe he's wrong. Maybe it was another car. But that's the typewriter is the one thing that the police is sure yeah, of. Yeah. And therefore, that's why he's going to jail. But there's no proof, really, that the hairy hand guy is Sesnek. Yeah. So if we imagine he didn't buy that typewriter and didn't write that document, it was planted in his uh, sawmill. Yeah, never. The letter was planted in a suitcase, yeah. not by him. They have nothing. Also, I mean, it was planted in the, pl- the business that he owned. It wasn't planted yeah. in his bedside cabinet. I mean, we're yeah, it talking wasn't a trophy. I mean, it's, well, it's not that the fact it was a trophy. It's the fact that I'm sure lots of people have access to that building. But we know there's about 12 employees. Yeah. 
So I mean, and it probably wasn't secure anyway. Exactly. You've exactly. seen the sawmill in Meso is just wide open. Yeah. So anybody would come. So exactly. So really, it's hard to know if he's really guilty or innocent because there's only one clue that condemned him, yeah. and it's a dodgy one. Because one, why keep it? Mm. Two, why even write that document? Exactly. That house wasn't that no, important. No, just no. So it, that, that, that's my whole. If I if I had been on a jury, I would not have been comfortable yeah. to to send somebody off to die in the heat. I, I don't know. I just would have. It would have been a a, a no from me uh, certainly. Anyway. Yeah, it, it is very difficult mm. to know what's going on. There's a lot of theories, and some of them we'll talk about it a bit later. Go on a completely different. Yeah. line and they would tend to show that he's actually innocent but was framed mm. by some random person because it was convenient that he was with him with yeah. the victim yeah. in the car and they thought oh, we're going to use him he's a pansy. but in fact he has absolutely mm. nothing to do with it he was really stupid he did go home instead of going to paris mm. and but really he there's no proof that he's done anything no except some strange witnesses and is it hard to buy a witness in the twenties when people were mostly poor? Yeah. Probably not that difficult. Yeah. So Especially not after the war and Especially after the war when people yeah. were super poor mm. when half the families were missing. Yeah, exactly. So many so people were dying from either losing their loved ones, you know, in the trenches and then of course you've got the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu, yeah. Yeah. So So, mm. so the story isn't over after the trial. Wow, okay. So one thing is the inquiry is reopened eight or nine times. Okay. So Sesnik himself has never stopped denying that he was innocent. And his wife and his descendants mm. have followed the same line. They all think that he was innocent, he was framed, and there must be something else. So the first time the inquiry is reopened is on the 6th of April 1925 when his wife gets the tribunal to reopen it because she says that the person he was supposed to meet wasn't invented so the tribunal says okay we're going to look into it more okay so they do they search for the person they found one but he denies to have any dealings mm. with Sesnek or even knowing him so that's ruled out and her appeal is rejected on the 7th of December 1926 then on the 9th of April 1935 at that point it's number four mm, opening. Okay. there's been two in between mm. I haven't any trace of those ones these are based, this one is based on missing documents regarding the property okay. because that only letter is not enough to buy the house. So they're saying if really he had bought the house, there would be more. Mm. Where's the rest? He can't possibly have expected to get the house just by that small letter saying, yeah. I'm going to pay you money. Mm -hmm. So they say, clearly, there's something missing there. It's, it's wrong. So they reopen the inquiry for that. That is also rejected. Then on the 22nd of June, 1948, it's the year after he comes back from prison. There's a fifth reopening of the inquiry. The prosecutor, the Republic prosecutor, uh, rejected on the 4th of March 1949. And as a result, the justice minister, minister at the time creates a commission to reevaluate criminal cases that can over the Sesnek affair. So their purpose is to take those strange cases. That, that just line. won't go away yeah, mm -hmm. and reinvestigate investigate them. And they do, and they still say, nope, we're not reopening it. It's still guilty. Does that include all the people who've already had their heads cut off? That's a bit late for those. Well. Yeah. <laughs> it's reopened twice again in September 51 and September 55. Again, wow. rejected every time. Then on the 9th of June 1977, the Sesnex wife manages to re have it reopened an eighth time. Wow. This time it's based on the writing expertise because she says that doesn't show that he wrote them. That's not true. It's rejected again on the 28th of June 1996. So there's a big 96? gap. 96? Yeah. It, Why did it, it take them 19 so... 19 years. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, how many words was it? I mean, it wasn't that many words. I don't know. I don't have the details of that commission, but it took them nearly 20 years to say, no, nope, we we're happy with the results. Oh, it's French bureaucracy. Um, to raise funds for all these reopenings of inquiries mm. because it cost costs money yeah, and lawyers. Course, yeah. Sesnek family creates um, an organization mm -hmm. which is called France Justice in 1995 and it's listed as an ONG at the UN. Wow. On the 23rd of June 1989, 
the law is modified so that the reopening in, of inquiries is not only based on the existence of new information that is likely to show that the mm -hmm. convicted person is in fact innocent, but also you can now reopen the inquiries if there is a chance that it's going to cast a doubt mm -hmm. on the conviction. Okay. So it's a lot easier. Yeah. So as a result of that, one in every 100 sentences are reversed. Mm -hmm. So quite a lot are. So of course, they try again. In 2001, the justice minister requires the inquiry to be opened again. Wow. <laughs> I lost track at that point. The commission accepts to reopen it and reinvestigate. That's, and that happens on the 11th of April 2005. They examine it until the 5th of October 2006. The commission is asked to accept that there is doubt on the guilt of Sesnek, in part because of the presence of Boni. Mm -hmm. The prosecutor, the prosecutor maintains that even though he was involved, even though we know everything about Boni, they don't think there's any link to Sesnek whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And because of the very low number of documents Boni signed, and therefore the very little amount of investigation he's done on the, on the case. That it's not going to have any... Even if he had it. tried mm. to, to frame Sesnek, he couldn't have. It was just... It wasn't possible. He, he was just too much of a peripheral character. Yeah. It, it wasn't possible for him mm. to change the direction of the inquiry. Yeah. So they reject the appeal again on the 14th of December 2006 because they say, well, there's no new evidence and there's just no reason to reopen it. And at that point, it seems to be the end of the story. The family did for a while, plan to appeal to the European Court of Human Rights. Wow. But after talking to their lawyers, they abandoned the idea. It's mm -hmm. just not going to work. So will it ever end? Well, <laughs> probably not. Because on the 20th of June 2014... Oh, that's recent. That's fairly recent. There's a new law that was passed again saying that the descendants of deceased sentence criminals can request reopening the investigation. That's like 90 years later. Yeah, yeah, we're getting close. Yeah, it's close to 100 years at that point. It's 90 wow. years. Yeah. So, Denis Sesnek, the grandson, yeah. that's him that does the whole thing. Um, he announced on the radio his intention to, <laughs> to do so on mm. the 19th of December 2014. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, one of the lawyers of the family, um, who was a lawyer before but wasn't anymore, publishes a book in February 2015. And in it, he mentions that Sesnik's son, so Guillaume Jr., mm -hmm. had made a testimony that was completely ignored by the police and the trial. That testimony was that when Kimono died on the 27th of May 1923, mm -hmm. he died at the Sesnik house. And apparently, according to him, it's because he was trying to attack his mom. She pushed him, he fell, hit his head, and died there in the house. So, so he appeared home the day before he said he was going to come home, and there was an accident. Yeah. Mm. So it sounds a bit unlikely. Yeah. Because he's supposed to be on his, road, on his way to Paris exactly. at that point. What yeah, was yeah. he doing well, in the he was, he was, Yeah, he was supposed to be on his way back from Paris at that point, wasn't he? He was yeah. due home on the 28th. Yeah, yeah no. So That smells. It, it does smell. Um, but that's what the lawyer says. Mm. And I haven't read the book, but apparently he has a fairly good argumentation that that could be the case. Mm. It is possible. So then Sesnik would have hidden the body with a few friends of his. Yeah. And he argues that those facts that were ignored by the police and the tribunal warrant a new reopening mm -hmm. of the inquiry, taking those into account. He also, in his book, points out that there are two completely different views of the story. One is his, that admits that Sesnik forged documents okay. and hid a body but didn't kill anyone. And the other one, which is the one held by his descendants, is that he was completely innocent of everything. Mm -hmm. He didn't do anything, he was just framed for the whole thing. Yeah. Following Guillaume Jr.'s revelations, mm -hmm. which apparently were dated 1978, according to the lawyer, the justice system refuses to reopen the inquiry for, I don't know, 12 times, 13th time. <laughs> I lost mm -hmm. track, I don't yeah. know how many times. Volunteers decide to search the house. Okay. Because if the body was hidden somewhere, most likely it would be around the house. So yeah. they decide to search themselves because the police refuses to do so. No, okay. So they do. And they search the house in Morley with the, the, the current owner says, yeah, you mm -hmm. can search my house. They found bones in February 2018. So they stop. Ooh, okay. They call the police. The police mm -hmm. comes. They collect the bones. 
at first they think it's a human femur and a head or part of a head. Okay. That looks good. Oh, exciting. The bones are sent for expertise later on, and it turns out um, that an expert from Nantes says that they're bovine. <sighs> so on the 3rd of March 2018, the police leaves the house, and mm. they say, okay, well, we haven't found anything. So the search starts again, but okay. they never find it. On earth would you have a whole cow leg in your, uh, in your house? Yeah, but remember, they were hold houses. Uh, it, as far as I remember, it was found in one of the cellars. Okay. But it could have been where cows were f- kept mm. at some point. Yeah, that's a good point. Look at our workshop. There were windows for chickens and cows. Mm, yeah. There's a window on the... Well, mm-hmm. There's an opening on the door, the roadside, clearly for a cow. And on the other side, the one used by the cat, yeah. clearly for chickens. So and you work, used and you work in a piggery. And I work in the piggery, so it's possible. Maybe mm. one of the the sellers was used to keep ha- uh, cows, that and one of them died, and yes. just you think some you think somebody mm. who lives rurally would take that into account. I apologise. <laughs> I don't know these white settlers. <laughs> On the, in early May 2018, two of Sesnik's grandsons report that they have been told by their dad that Guillaume heard the screams from his mom as well, because she was being attacked by a camino in the house. And they essentially confirm the story as their dad told them. So it's the same story from the same person told by two different okay. people. Okay, but still within the same family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they confirm everything and they say he must be buried somewhere, but they don't know where yeah, he's okay. buried. They also think that there were some accomplices to get rid of the body mm-hmm. and that involves the church. Apparently the, in the ch- near the church, they swore not to tell anyone about what they've done. Okay. And the church kind of is involved and mm, all okay, that. Okay, okay. Again, there's no proof of anything. No. It's just, it's just a, the church has got an opul- awfully good reputation of hiding uh, wrongdoings. Also in 2018, an old woman called Cecilia Morand, who's 85 at the time, is interviewed on the radio and she, te- she tells another story. <laughs> She says that her dad buried Kimono's body with another guy called uh, Raymond Lenny, a mechanic Mm -hmm. and garage owner. She says that her dad at the time was in charge of the cemetery in a small village near Oudan. Remember, they've been seen in Oudan, uh, in Paris. Mm -hmm. And she says that they used uh, an abandoned grave to put the body in, and that's where the body is hidden. An abandoned grave? Did the the occupier get up and leave? (laughs) She says that Raymond Lenny um, is the one who killed Kemener because they had dispute about uh, car repair. Okay, that's a bit weak. The grandson, Den- Denis, uh-huh. Denis, considers the story credible. <laughs> but really, if you look at it a bit more closely, it's full of holes. So, for example, she wasn't born in 1923, so she can't remember, she's been told. Yeah. Also, Raymond Lenny wasn't a mechanic, he was an electrician. Her dad wasn't in charge of the cemetery in the 20s. He was in the 50s. Mm. There's so many holes in her story that it's not credible. Uh, it's just one but of these. She was interviewed many times on the radio, and there's still mentions of her testimony. And yeah. People are still. Oh, it just yeah, sounds like one of these family legends that have been twisted and blown out of Probably, proportion, yeah. and there's no real crumb of truth in it whatsoever. Yeah. So even today, the affair is still discussed and debated mm. and there are two camps that are the for and the against Sesnik. Yeah. And because there are so many not dodgy but very weak mm. um witnesses and evidence, it's hard to be convinced that he actually did what he's told to have done. Yeah. So the only real proof is the typewriter, but there's no real proof that he bought it. And yeah. if you don't have that, it could have been bought by anyone. It could mm. have just been put in the sawmill. And at that point, the whole thing is just framing Sesnek mm-hmm. because he's an easy one to, to frame. Yeah. So that's the end of the story as of 2018. Mm. No doubt there will be more at some point, but of course there's fewer and fewer people who were mm. born oh, on, and yes. remember the story and were even, involved. Even in French terms, yes, yeah, they're starting to get 1923, it. 1923, even my grandmother wasn't born. She was born in 25. Yeah, mm-hmm. Well, one of them. The one thing that mm. the Sesnik affair did is show people what the okay. prison Guyana was like. So some people so say much. that he mm. played a part in closing it because his affair was in the news for 40 years or so 
and people heard about what was like life like in Guyana and all that. Mm. And that's part of why they closed it after the Second World War. Oh, well, something good came out of it. Yeah. And I think the moral of the story is sometimes it doesn't matter how many inquiries you have, you still can't see the wood for the trees. <laughs>